okay so we can get started uh, we were discussing cooperative game theory and so far we have talked about two things with transferable utility okay uh, we talked about two concepts the first one was imputation so x of b comma b is given by x in rn such that xi is greater than <coughs> equal to vi so that was individual rationality and the second thing was summation of xi equals to vs i in s uh, this is for all s in b and this is budget balance efficiency okay so we have a coalition structure b we have a coalition structure b v is the coalition value function it had some specific name what was the name coalition function okay so v was the coalition function and <coughs> how do you divide the pi well you divide the pi in a way that it satisfies individual rationality and efficiency okay that was the first solution method for cooperative game the second thing we studied was core uh which is c of n comma v so core is defined for the grand coalition okay so your b is so b is equal to n and that is x in x and v such that it satisfies group rationality so the group rationality is summation xi i in s should be greater than equal to v of s uh this should hold for all s in for all s which is a subset of for all s which is a subset of the grand coalition so this was <coughs> group rationality okay so there are many ways to divide the pi and these two methods imputation and core has some desirable properties of dividing the pi so for imputation it is individual rationality and efficiency and core in the case of grand coalition is an imputation which also satisfies group rationality so there are two conditions here uh, you have an additional three conditions in the core okay and the idea is well the set of inequalities uh, the set of x's that will satisfy this inequality is huge so you have large number of methods to divide the pi we don't like it because uh, you know there is group there is room for negotiation and then there will be a lot of negotiation and people will be happy some people will be unhappy so you somehow want to constrain the way you can divide the pi so core allows you to do that in the case of grand coalition by adding some another set of inequalities but that's again in some <coughs> sense that's not useful because it's not like we have a unique solution here it's still multiple solutions you have just added more inequality so the set uh so in this case the imputation set might be this big this would be your x and if you look at the core c it might be something that sits within the set x okay so again that's not useful because there are still infinitely many solutions within the core so that's not good so we stopped yesterday uh, not yesterday but uh, in the previous class we stopped at a point where we wanted to identify uh, necessary and sufficient <coughs> conditions for the core to be non empty so how do we know by looking at the coalition value or coalition function how do we know that 
there will be an x. So, this set of x uh, which satisfies these three inequalities uh, individual rationality, efficiency and group rationality that there is some point there. So, it is not completely empty. So, that is answered by uh, Bondarova Shapley theorem. And uh, I had given you the idea in the previous class towards the end of previous class, how do you exactly get uh, the, what is the way to get uh, the inequalities. So let me just state the theorem directly uh, without going into the intuition because that was covered in the previous class. And if you don't recall it, please go back and review the lecture, uh, at least the last 10 minutes of the lecture of the previous class. Okay. So I have a, a, a definition first. So D, let's say it's a, it's a collection of subsets of uh, N is balanced if there exists a delta which depends on D greater than 0 such that this is the incidence matrix this is the player these are the coalitions, I mean the subsets SK and in this particular uh, entry you have to indicator function, you have this indicator function 1 in S1, indicator function 1 in SK and in general you, your uh, your ith row, so let me write it as ith row and the jth column would essentially be indicator function i in sj. Okay, so it is equal to 1 if 1 is part of coalition, uh, uh, not a coalition, but 1 is part of S1 and it is equal to 1 if 1 is part of SK and it is equal to 0 if 1 is not in S1 then this term is, this value is 0. So you have this is known as incidence matrix, so some of you who might have studied uh, graph theory would know about uh, incidence matrix, so it is very similar in concept to that. Okay. <coughs> so any questions? Okay, so we construct this incidence matrix, I multiply it with this vector dd which is strictly delta d which is strictly positive and what I get is a vector of 1 okay and delta d is an rk rk okay So let us see an example. So let us say my n is 1, 2, 3 and my s1 is 1, 2 and S2 is 2, 3, 
Okay, what would be my incidence matrix? So I have one, two, three, and then S one and S two. So is one in S one? Yes. Is one in S two? No. Two in S one? Yes. Two in S two? Yes. Three in S one? No. Three in S two? Yes. Okay, so this is my incidence matrix. <coughs> okay. So I need uh, to have delta in R2, right? So there is uh, something here that I need to put uh, so as to make this vector resulting matrix multiplication all should all the elements of this uh, vector should be equal to 1 well if you stare at this equation for sufficiently long time you would realize that there is no such delta D okay so no such delta D exists that can make all of these terms equal to 1 so no such delta D exists okay so this is not a balanced coalition so this d which consists of s1 and s2 is not a balanced coalition okay does that make <coughs> sense yeah is it a system you're saying it is like any one thing to be part of only one well not really let's say i put an s3 which says 1 comma 3 then suddenly it becomes balanced okay so then delta d would be 1 3 1 3 1 3 no 1 half 1 half 1 half and we'll have the solution okay so let's uh, so right now I don't have s3 okay then it's not balanced now let me put so this is clear to everyone okay this is not balanced let me put s3 now which is equal to 1 comma 3 then I have to change this this matrix I have to talk about s3 as well so s3 is 1 in s3 yes 2 in s3 no 3 in s3 yes and then I can put 1 half 1 half 1 half that gives me exactly equal to 1 1 1 okay so this is my delta D so delta D exists in this case and therefore S1, S2, S3 is a balanced coalition. Now for this uh, balanced coalition, let me define V of D as V of S1, V of S2 and V of S3 okay of course if you have sk then your v v v vector is going to be a k dimensional uh, real num uh, k dimensional uh, value Okay, so what's the theorem? <coughs> this is also a definition. So C of n comma V is non-empty if and only if for every balanced D we have delta D transpose VD is less than equal to VN.
okay so now you might argue that what I'm asking you to do I have this n set of players n could be 100 first I have to figure out every possible <coughs> balance set okay so that's probably 2 raised to n possibilities okay and many combinations thereof so it's really a huge set uh, the set of balance sets is a huge set and then for every such d for, for every such balance set d a balance coalition d I need to figure out what delta d is I need to come up with this vector I need to take the inner product and then I have to check whether it is less than or equal to v of n or not right you can argue so that that checking whether a core is non-empty or not based on just the value coalition value alone coalition function alone seems to be a fairly daunting task right uh, which is true but in many cases if you put additional structure on the cooperative game for instance if it is uh, a market game or a simple game or a cost sharing game or something of that sort it's much easier to check it's much easier to characterize a set of all balance sets and then check this condition holds or not which allows you to prove that the core is going to be non-empty for that particular class of game okay so all so this is a it's not a computationally efficient algorithm it doesn't give you a computationally efficient algorithms but there are smaller subsets of cooperative games for which it is easy to prove that the core is going to be non-empty okay it's not going to be completely empty so that's uh, that's what the the usefulness of this particular theorem is and we'll use this theorem when we talk about cost sharing game uh, in the next class okay any question about this okay and it's an if and only if condition which means if core is non empty then this should be true and if this is true then the core is non empty okay one side is easy to prove the other side is very very difficult to prove okay and uh, to give you some ideas you can prove this result using the duality concept from optimization that many of you know right so the uh, so duality separating hyperplane theorem no not separating supporting hyperplane theorem and uh, some other uh, I think these are the two methods that are given in this book so you can use any of those two methods to actually prove this result but it's a long proof it's not a simple proof okay so now we know that imputation is one way of dividing the pi core is another way of dividing the pi this theorem suggests a way to check whether the core is non-empty or not at least core for the grand coalition so the next topic is what happens when if you want to define core for a uh, for a game without the grand coalition so core with core of general B so for a general B you define the core So remember that imputation had, so this is individual rationality plus efficiency and the core, the C of N B also had an additional constraint of group rationality, right? But the group rationality with respect to the grand coalition, right? So every subset of the grand coalition uh, it should satisfy the group rationality condition but now we don't have a grand coalition we have like smaller subsets of people who have formed their own group and they are just dividing the pi among themselves so what do you think should be the additional condition uh, imposed on the set of possible uh, distribution of uh, possible way to distribute the pi any thoughts yeah so we want summation of xi i in t 
should be greater than equal to v of t for all t which is a subset of n okay so the idea is that this coalition structure i have this coalition structure b so let's say uh, i decided to stay alone because that gives me the best payoff and you guys formed a group okay so b consists of me alone one set and then all of you as the second set and then what you have to see is no matter which other coalition structure we form so if you guys want to form your own coalition structure <coughs> this is the value this, if you want to form your own coalition let's say two of you want to form your own group this is the value you would create but the amount of payoff that you are going to get in this coalition is going to be greater than equal to the value you two can create on your own okay so there is no incentive for you to branch away from this class and form your own smaller group okay so that's a uh, that's in some sense is imposing the stability condition for any other t which is a subset of n if i try to divide the pi uh the sum of the payoff that i can that the members in t can potentially get has to be greater than equal to the total value that the group t can create um uh, independently okay so again individual rationality plus efficiency and this you can think of as a version of group rationality for every possible subset t so so again imputation is large you reduce the size of imputation by adding additional constraint but it's still large okay so uh, i'm not happy if you ask me uh if you want to uh let's say divide the pi according to some rule in core uh people would argue that you know why is he getting more i am getting less and so on and so forth okay so it's not very appealing property so what would be an appealing property of a of a way to divide this uh value well there has to be a unique solution or something that is at least a finite number of solutions so we can at least pick and choose what to do uh with the total value that the group is creating so that uh is done using shapley value so that's the next topic so that's the third solution concept this is 1953 uh so shapley asked himself uh the following question how would a fair jets let's say you have a grand coalition so b is equal to n you have a grand coalition how should a fair judge So if I am the judge okay if I am the judge and I am asked to allocate the value v of n I have I have v of n money with me and I need to allocate it among uh, the people the participants of this particular game I am I want to be a fair judge what exactly is the criteria for being fair in this particular game so let's see fair judge what do you think a fair judge should should satisfy should do in this case well the the allocation has to be efficient so the first property is efficient which means summation of xi i in n has to be equal to vn 
Okay, so this is we understand what this means. Okay, it has to be budget balanced. So also the second property is symmetry. Okay, so symmetry means two people with equal, uh, with the same set of skills should get the same amount of money. Okay, so how do you capture that, uh, that idea here? So what do you think, how do you think you would capture this idea that two people with the same skill should get the same amount of money? So how do you, how do you capture the fact that two people have same skill? Any thoughts? Value should be the same. Okay, so let's see. So we'll say that I and J in N is R symmetric. Should it be uh, is or R? R. R? Okay. <laughs> symmetric if for every S, which is a subset of N minus I comma J, so I have n players, I remove i and j, and I come up with a subset. My v of s union i is equal to v of s union j. Okay, so they create the same value no matter which group they join. So of course, if two players are symmetric, they bring the same value to any group in which they are not uh, already a part of. Remember, S doesn't contain J, okay? So they are not part of S at all. They bring the same value. Therefore, uh, if <coughs> I comma J are symmetric, then Xi equals Xj. So that's symmetry. Yeah. Well, no, in the next solution concept that we'll talk about. Efficiency is not required. What I mean is that if we have a value that will be shared among Yes, so that is imposing that constraint that the value has to be shared among the players. You can't have... Uh, see, budget balance is an important concept, okay? So the value that you create is shared among the people. You can have excess value, which is more value created than what you share among people. Now. In real life, we keep that value for the future, okay? But in this mathematical construct, it's a static game. Things are going to end by the end of the day. So therefore, it has to be an efficient distribution. Uh, you could also have cases where you promise more money than what you actually create, in which case, you know what happens to them, right? They file for bankruptcy in that case. In fact, uh, in fact, bankruptcy problem is a well-studied problem as part of cooperative game theory, okay? So that's where n is the number of uh, credit agencies like banks who have given a loan, and then you need to divide the uh, a company files for bankruptcy, so they have some assets, and you need to divide it among the people who have actually given this company a loan, okay? So it probably was used, hopefully it was used during the financial crisis when many companies actually filed for bankruptcy. Okay. Uh, third, so I'm a fair judge. I want the allocation to be efficient. I want the allocation to be symmetric. Uh, the third is uh, null player property. Okay, now this is important. 
if I am a person who just sits and looks at the sky all day long, how much should I get paid for doing doing that job, whatever that job is? Okay, zero, right? So if I am a null player, I should get zero amount of money. So how do you define null player? How do you define null player? Doesn't change the value, right? So, so I in N is null player if for every S as a subset of N minus I, V of S union I is equal to V of S. Doesn't change the value. Of course, you can also take S equals to phi, like the null, null uh, set, in which case you get VI equals zero. Okay, so if I is null player, then Xi is equal to zero. If I don't bring any value to the group, to any group, okay, this this person I is not bringing value to any group, okay. So no matter which group he joins, he doesn't change the value of the group. So that person should be paid zero amount of money. And then the fourth is additivity. Which means I have two games, V and W. Okay, I have two games, V and W. I can either join the two cooperative games together and then compute how much money each person should get or I can play each of those games individually and figure out how much each person should get and it should be the same. Okay, so if you have Uber United States and Uber Canada, so they are the same players. Uh, and then you have Amtrak United States and Amtrak Canada, they are the same players. And if you join the two countries together and look at the overall business and should they cooperate or not cooperate, it, or, and if they cooperate, how much should each of those individual companies should get? Should be the same as the sum of money they would get in United States plus sum of money they would get in Canada. Okay, so that should be true for every player I. People don't like this assumption. I mean, economists don't like this assumption because uh, many a times joining hands. So. Playing two separate cooperative games is not the same as playing the two cooperative games together. Okay, but whatever. This is seems like a reasonable uh, reasonable thing to do for a fair judge. Okay, so first thing I want to hear your views. Do you think that a fair judge should come up with an allocation policy that satisfies these four? conditions. Okay. Do you have any trouble with any of these assumptions? The only thing I see is if a player brings more value to the game, right. then shouldn't they get more of the pie? Well, yeah. If they, have fair, if they have the same value, they get the same amount of pie. If they right. have zero value, they get zero amount of pie. There's no Right. No constraints saying that if you bring more to the coalition, you should get more. Of the right, level. right. I mean, in some sense, these null player is easy to define, symmetric players are easy to define, but who brings more value depends on what coalition uh, you are forming. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, if I was a mathematician in 15th century, I wasn't bringing value to any group, okay? It was, if, if I were a painter, I was bringing a lot of value, okay? People would paint and get lots of money and so on. But if I was a mathematician and I wanted to study, I don't know, complex numbers, I mean, nobody is interested in me. I'll probably be penniless on the streets, uh, whatever. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, the value thing, who brings more value is, is quite difficult to define. 
So let's see some examples of how would this fair judge allocate uh, the value uh, to every individual. So this is, these are the four properties that we all think should be satisfied for xi. So the first example is xi equals to vi. Whatever value you create individually, that's what you're going to get paid. So three of you got together, formed a company, and you decided that you will pay yourself whatever your, your existing pay is on your own. Which of these four assumptions, or not four assumptions, but four criteria would this not satisfy? This way of dividing the pie. Sorry? Two, three? First three. First three. It won't satisfy first three? It might not be efficient, that's true, it's not efficient. So, does not satisfy one. Does not satisfy one. Okay. Uh, but it satisfies symmetry, null player property, and additivity. Okay, it does. Because see, I can take my S equals phi. So, VI is equal to VJ. So, two people who earn the same salary, and therefore they are symmetric. In this case also, VI equals VJ, so XI equals XJ. So symmetry is satisfied. In this case, again, vi equals 0. And so xi is equal to 0. So it satisfies null player property. And this is fourth is also trivial to show. But it doesn't satisfy efficiency. So it's not a good solution concept. The fair judge would reject this, uh, this solution concept. Now the second solution concept is interesting. So xi would be equal to vi plus uh, you know I want to uh, so it's zero if i equals dummy or null player i is null player and and then whatever is uh, the value, it will be shared equally among all non-null players. So, so let me write it down. V of n minus summation V i V j j not null over n minus number of null players if i is not null. OK, this is one way of allocating the resource, uh, the, allocating the value. OK. So this is what the player would get individually, and this is what the extra generated by forming a coalition, but you remove all those players who are null players. Okay, players who don't bring any value, you remove them, and then you divide the pie equally among each other. So this one satisfies efficiency, satisfies symmetry, satisfies null player property, because null players get zero, but it doesn't satisfy additivity. So satisfy 4. Okay. Uh, so again, a fair judge would rule out that way of uh, dividing the pie because it doesn't look good. Now let's look at the third example. Where xi is the max value a person creates. So max s such that 
i does not belong to s v of s union i minus v of s so this is the maximum value that a person creates somebody mentioned this did you mention it yeah. the maximum value that a person creates how much should that person get okay so in this well this is not a solution but this is one way of allocating the value well you give to player i you give the amount that the player brings to any particular group so this one does not satisfy i mean obviously efficiency does not satisfy it also does not satisfy the additivity property so a fair judge would rule this out as a possibility of allocating the value and the fourth one is <coughs> i have some specific ordering of individuals players and this one does not satisfy what would it not satisfy sorry symmetry does not satisfy two okay so shapley started with an axiomatic approach to figure out how to divide a pie he said there are four axioms efficiency symmetry null player property additivity we all agree that those conditions are the minimal conditions that should be satisfied by any allocation property any reasonable allocation property so fine so we started playing around with how to allocate the resource so we came up with four possible ways of allocating resource turns out that they don't satisfy any at least there is one property that they don't satisfy okay at least one property in this case it didn't satisfy two properties so what is the way to uh to solve this problem it turns out that shapley came up with an exam with a with a way to uh, divide the pie that's known as shapley value so before i introduce that let me introduce permutations of players okay so pi from n to n permutations so this is a relabeling relabeling process so on one day i am player 1 you are player 2 on the second day you become player 2 i become player 1 okay so every day we sort of permute the set of players and there are two ways to n such permutations okay and pi <coughs> set of all permutations okay so what i am doing is just changing the names of individuals changing the indices of individuals and then i define this set pi of pi which depends on a permutation pi which is j in n such that pi j is less than pi i Okay. 
And so Shapley value theorem, there exists a unique x in Rn that satisfies 1 to 4. So it satisfies all four properties, so that's very appealing. It's unique, that's even more appealing, where xi is the expected value with respect to a uniform distribution over pi of v pi pi union i minus v pi pi. You know, I, even though this is what is written in the book, I feel that it should be pi i and not i itself. Okay, so I'm writing the equation from the book, but my feeling is this should be pi i and not i. But, but this is what's there in the book, so I'll have to contact the author. Yes? How many are there? Two raised to n. Yeah, you label them with each possible. So you pick a permutation at random, uniformly at random. So each permutation has a probability 1 over 2 raised to n. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. n factorial, that's right. n factorial, that's right, yeah. Okay, so there are, so 1 over n factorial is the probability of picking one permutation. And then you calculate this marginal value that player i is bringing to the group. And then you take the expected value, and that should be xi. This is also given as 1 over n factorial summation. s is a subset of n minus i, I think, <coughs> n minus i, s factorial n minus s minus 1 factorial mm. over there's no nothing over v of s union i minus v of i Okay, so that's the uh, that is the Shapley value. Yeah. So as you can see, Shapley value, which is x i, is proportional to the value player i brings to every possible group because remember s is a subset of n minus i so it is a proportional to the ex the extra value sorry this should be v of s v of s here so this is the extra value that player i brings to the group s and then you have some weights that you multiply it to and then sum it over all possible uh, values and you get the shapley value of player i uh, the most important property that you should note is the uniqueness property. Okay, so so that's why it's very helpful because if 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 you have a group of participants, all of them agree to these four axioms that Shapley put forth, then you have a unique way of dividing the pi, and nobody can uh, argue against or for it because they agree to these four axioms. Okay. 
So that's the uh, that's the Shapley value. So this is the third solution concept. So we started with uh, we started with uh, imputation. Then we studied core. Now we studied Shapley value, which is a unique solution concept. So it's much better than core, at least more preferred than core. And then the fourth solution concept is nucleolus. nucleolus so in order to uh, motivate the discussion of uh, nucleolus here is the problem that I want to put forth I have a company that has gone bankrupt okay so I have some table chairs some property okay and let's say the total value is E uh, no, I want to give it some other name. Uh, okay. Total asset is A. A is the asset. And I own debt D1 to Dn from N lenders. Okay. So I had gone to some place, I bought some tables and chairs on loan. Okay. And that is D1. And then I went to someone else and bought something else. D2 and D3 and all the way up to Dn. So there are N lenders and I'm going to apply for bankruptcy but what is the problem? The problem is A is less than summation of Di, I equals 1 to N. So I own a lot of debt but my assets are not valued. Uh, the, my assets are less than the amount of debt that I owe. Okay. A judge needs to divide this asset among these n lenders. Okay. So what would judge try to do? Okay. No matter what the judge does, it's going to make everyone unhappy. Okay, because they are not going to recover their entire DI back. So judge is going to make everyone very unhappy, but he wants to minimize the total discontent among all n lenders okay that's what its go his goal is so the judge's goal is minimize this content okay so let's come up with a theoretical framework that minimizes this content among a group of uh, people who are cooperating together. So in order to motivate the discussion, let me talk about uh, lexicographic order. Okay, so this is a small detour uh, to understand a very important concept of ordering in d-dimensional space. The lexicographic order on RD. Okay, so let's look at a real number, R1. I have two points, A and B. Is there a natural order on what is less than what? Okay, so if B is on the right side of A, then we know that A is less than or equal to B. Okay, there is a natural order on a real line. Now I want to extend this ordering to a higher dimensional space. What should I do? So let's say I have two vectors, x1 and x2. Let's say I have 1, 1 
and I have one one and I have 0 0.5 and 3. So this is my x1. Uh, I don't want to give it x1. Z, z1. And this is my point z2. You know, here I was able to say a is less than or equal to b. How do I say z1 is less than or equal to z2 or z2 is less than or equal to z1? Okay, sorry. Compare the first first element. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll compare the first element of z1 and the first element of z2. Whichever is lower, I will say that this is less than the other number. So I have z2 is less than or equal to z1. In this case, let's look at another point, z3 which is equal to 3 and 3. Okay, so I look at the first element, uh, z1 equals, so, so in this case z1 is less than z3, less than equal to z3. So I'm going to write it as L, L. This ordering is with respect to the lexicographic order on R2. Okay, now I have another point, z4, which is equal to 1 and minus 1. So now I'm in trouble, okay? So the first element of z1 is 1, and the first element of z4 is also 1. Uh, but let's look at the second element. Well, the second element of z1 is greater than the element of z4. So what I have is z4 is less than or equal to z1. Okay, so that's the lexicographic ordering on RD. Does that make sense? Yeah. What is the reason behind adding the less than equal to symbol? Why not just the less? Well, yeah, it will be less than. Uh, equal to is only when all the elements are the same. Uh, what you're saying is this should be strictly less than. Well, yes, you are right. This is strictly less than the way I have written it. Okay, and it will be equal when all the elements are the same. So this, this concept can be extended to any dimensional space, Rd. Okay? Look at the first element. If they are the same, then look at the second element. If they are the same, look at the third element and so on. That's what you wanted to ask? Okay. Okay, so that's fairly clear. So let's get back to, so that's the small d2. Let's get back to the discussion on nucleolus. I define the excess. So let's pick pick X in Rn. Okay. So in this particular case, X is Xi is the amount of money that lender I is going to get. Okay. So I pick an X in Rn, and I define the excess of S comma X, okay, and S is a subset of N, which will be denoted by small e S comma X, which is equal to B S minus summation X I, I in S. Okay, that's my excess. Now it could be negative, it could be positive, it could be zero. Okay, so in the in the debtor case, well, in this bankruptcy problem, uh, this will be probably negative all the time, right? Because v of n minus summation of x i. Well, actually, it won't be uh, less than it won't be less than zero because x i is not equal to d i. Okay, so. Uh, but yeah, that's defined as excess. So you have the core of n comma v, 
which is defined as x in x and b such that e of s comma x is less than equal to 0 for every s in n. Okay, so core can be defined in terms of xs. You want the xs to be less than equal to 0 for every s. Now I'm going to let theta, which maps from Rn to R, 2 raised to n, okay, which is the map theta of x equals to E s1 x E s2 raised to n x. Okay, so I have this S1, S2, S3, S4, all the way up to S2 raised to n. They are all the subsets of n, capital N, uh, not capital N, but the set N, such that E of S1 comma X is greater than or equal to E of S2 comma X greater than or equal to Okay, so I, what did I do? Well, I have n players, I pick a value x in Rn, which is the way the payoff is going to be uh, decided for every individual, and I'm going to map it to a much higher dimensional space, uh, which considers all possible <coughs> subsets of n, and figures out the excesses of every possible subset, and then it arranges them in, an in, in a decreasing order. So E of S1 X is highest. So S1 is the set of people among whom the discontent would be the highest, okay, in this case, in the bankruptcy problem. Okay, so the excess is highest, then the excess is highest. The, sorry, for S2 it's the second highest excess. For S3 it would be the third highest excess and so on. Remember that the goal of the judge is to minimize the maximum discontent in this particular case. So I'll add another part in the goal, minimize maximum discontent. Okay, so it becomes a min-max problem. Okay, so, so let's say K is a subset of Rn. Okay, first of all, I want to ask if there is any question on this issue, on this uh, definition of theta. Clear? Okay. So all of us understand what excess is, and all of us understand this map theta that maps x to a very high dimensional space. Now I pick a set k in Rn, okay, this Rn, and I assume that it is compact. You can do it for a non-compact set as well, yes? Sorry? Yes, will be different from the set x2, yeah, yeah, that's right. So it depends, this s1, s2, s3 depends on x. Okay, they are not independent of X. Yeah. Okay. So now K is a compact set in Rn. The nucleolus of N, V, and K, K is this compact set, is defined as X in K such that theta x is less than equal to in the lexicographic order to theta y for all y in k. 
And of course, uh, typically, we pick k equals x b b. Okay, imputation. Okay, so that's another uh, way to define what a solution should be. Uh, and if you think about what the judge is trying to do in this particular case, so what is the first element of theta x? Well, it's the excess of S1. What would be the first element of theta of y? It'll be the maximum excess, well, let's say, the first element of theta x is the maximum excess when x is the chosen uh, payoff, uh, x is the way to choose, x is the allocation by the judge. Okay, so that's the maximum excess, uh, the first element, and the first element of y is maximum excess at y, and you want the maximum excess to be less than equal to the maximum excess of y for every possible y in k. Okay, and if you achieve that, then you go and look at the second. So if there are two points, x and y, that have the same maximum excess, then you go and look at the second most, second highest excess, and the third highest excess, and so on. Okay, so this is what uh, it should satisfy. Nucleolus is also, it's non-empty. Uh, when k is compact, it is non-empty. And sometimes it's also unique. Okay, so it gives you a unique way to allocate the value among different people in the group. But, but by far, of course, the Shapley value is the cleanest way to allocate resources. This is a much more complicated way. But it's used in uh, bankruptcy problems, okay? So if you have an asset that you want to distribute among n people, uh, this is exactly how you would do it, okay? So you want to minimize the maximum discontent among the people, among the lenders. Any question about nucleolus? No. Okay. So if you look at the train of thought that, yeah. Um, isn't there many options for the value of the compare? Sorry, is the, are there? I mean, it is computationally difficult. Yeah, it's not a simple way of doing. Shapley value is fairly simple. Okay, you have to sum marginal values. Okay, easy to compute. This is not that easy to compute, unless of course you put a lot of structure on the game. Like bankruptcy problem has a specific structure. Each x and y is a vector in Rn, yes. So the possibilities Yeah, a lot, yes, infinite. But, but there could be, so once you put sufficient structure on the game itself, the value function satisfies some property and n is a certain number of people, then the computation becomes much easier. It's not as bad. I mean, uh, you know, of course, it's, it, the example is there in the book, and I don't quite know, uh, I haven't studied those examples very carefully. But you know, in these ancient texts, if you have three wives and the person dies, how exactly should the property be divided among three wives? Okay, so somebody will say, well, it should be divided equally. Somebody would say, well, the first wife should get the maximum share, the second wife should get the second max, and the third wife will get third max share. You know, so there are all these different, different ideas in the religious texts or these ancient texts. Apparently, they all satisfy some of these properties, okay? Either they are Shapley value or they are nucleolus. <laughs> so, so it seems like they did, they were able to solve these ancient people through repeated games or whatever means they had at that time. They were able to solve these problems and figure out uh, that, oh, this seems to be the most satisfactory way of dividing the property of a person who has died, okay? Uh, I mean, I've neither read those documents, so I cannot 
verify the authenticity, but since they have written in the book, it probably is correct, okay? And, and they figured out how to do it uh, using cooperative game concepts, which weren't even defined uh, at, that, at that age. So, um, so yeah, so bankruptcy or dividing the assets after death and so on, all of them can be solved using some of these, uh, these concepts. Okay, so we, we started with a cooperative game and then we defined imputation for a coalition structure, then we defined core for a coalition structure, then we defined Shapley value, okay, um, which is for grand coalition, and then we defined nucleolus uh, in a very weird fashion, okay. We want to minimize the excess, uh, we want to minimize the maximum excess. Okay, that's the solution concept that we are adopting in nucleolus. So those are the four, uh, four ways you can divide the pie. Uh, you can probably come up with other ways, but these are the four most common ways nowadays. Uh, used in many issues, uh, m many things in uh, economics. I don't know how we in engineering can use it, uh, but certainly some of you might figure out a way to allocate the spectrum or a way to share a bandwidth in a communication network or something using cooperative game, okay? So who knows, okay, you will come up with some other method of using these ideas for engineering or uh, electrical engineering application, okay? So uh, yeah, that ends the discussion on cooperative game. The next class we'll talk about cost sharing game, which is a very small subclass of cooperative game. And the idea is how do you share the cost of building an infrastructure or uh, doing uh, something that's common to everyone, okay? But of course, not everyone is going to use the thing to the fullest, so how do you share the cost? Now, how is cost sharing going to be useful? My belief is in the future when you have uh, Uber and Lyft and I don't know, Quota and Amtrak, all of them collaborating together, you will have to run some of these algorithms in the background in real time uh, so as to figure out how much each rider has to pay for going from point A to point B and how is that money going to, be going to be allocated to every person who is facilitating that entire uh, route planning as well as uh, picking up and dropping off of passengers. So who knows, I mean, we, th this is an exploratory topic and maybe some of you can benefit from it. Uh, so that's what we are going to study in the next class. Okay.